Officially, good morning, church. It is good to be with you. If you are new to the church, my name is John Cook, and I am the pastor of care and counseling here, and it's a joy to be with you. If you are watching online, hello, please engage with your online hosts. And for our folks down in Fredericksburg, so glad that you are with us. Thank you for joining us. I think you've got one more week, and Pastor Caleb will be back. Yay. Pastor Caleb, I don't know if you guys know, Pastor Caleb is our Fredericksburg campus pastor, and he and his wife just had their second baby, and uh, it's pretty doggone cool. Apparently, she is just the easiest baby ever, which no parent should ever have that. Yeah. (laughs) It should be difficult from day one. No. No. Hey, listen, we are going to continue our series, Blueprint, uh, as we look through the book of Ephesians, and I hope that you all have enjoyed this. Uh, if, again, if you're kind of new to this, we're doing a six-week series uh, going through the book of uh, Ephesians, and we passed out the first week, and I hope a bunch of you were able to get those hard copies of the devotionals that myself and, and the other pastors we helped put together, which we really enjoyed doing. A um, lot of work, uh, but we think it was very, very, um, it's very rich, and I hope that you all are getting something out of that. If you were unable to get one of those hard copies, you can go to the Mount Ararat website, mtararat, A-R-A-R-A-T dot O-R-G. If you go to resources underneath there, you'll be able to find, continue the conversation, and the entire blueprint section, uh, six weeks of devotionals five days a week that you can see those. We are going to be in chapter four of the book of Ephesians, and this is really the turning point. Uh, We're going to kind of, Paul is going to take within this letter that he wrote, he is making a kind of a turn. And in other words, because of what we've learned in Christ, this is how we ought to live. And just give you a little recap, the first three chapters really are explaining about what we have in Jesus Christ, what God the Father, what Jesus the Son, and what the Holy Spirit has done for us. And because of this, this is how we ought to live, chapters four, five, and six. And so we've looked at that, and I love, love, love. And uh, a number of years ago, I, uh, uh, we hosted a, uh, a home group in our house, and we went through the book of Ephesians, and it was probably one of the first times I did a real, real in-depth look into Ephesians, and I had heard this from somebody about this breakup, that the the first three chapters are all about what we get, okay, or what God, let me put it this way, what God has done for us, and then chapters four, five, and six, because of that, this is how we ought to live. And the instruction was, go through the first three chapters, and I'm going to challenge each of you to do this. Now, I don't have it in this Bible, but in another Bible, when I did that, I, I did this. Grab a red marker or a pen or something like that or a pink highlighter, something that you normally don't use, a different color that you normally don't use when you're reading your Bible and underlying. And by the way, if you think that you cannot write in a Bible, somebody lied to you, okay? I want to encourage you to use it and write write in it and highlight it and put notes and different things like that. But what we did is you go through the first three chapters and you start looking it through the lens of, okay, what is it that Jesus, what is it that God, what is the Holy Spirit that is giving me or giving us? And you just start underlining. And I kid you not, after uh, a process of about three weeks of doing this, the first three chapters were highlighted in red. It's amazing what God has given us. It's amazing the depths at which God goes to to enter into relationship with each one of us, us collectively as a church, but also us, you or I, me, we as individuals. The depths that God goes through to enter into relationship with us. Now, I will tell you, last week, Pastor Jason, if you did not listen to Pastor Jason's message about being rooted and established in love, uh, first of all, put your hand out. Shame on you, okay? It was really, really good. It was really, really good because everything that God does for us, everything that the Father does, everything that Jesus does, everything that the Holy Spirit does for us is rooted and established in his great love for us. 
is rooted and established in his great love for us. And for many of us, that's hard to comprehend because in our little soundbite world, in our little CNN shots, in our little Twitter or our little Instagram things, we either have a very distorted sense that God is this terrifying thing that's looking to smite me or this very, very, very passive milk toast God. But as we begin to understand who God is, understand what he is doing for us and what that love entails is both justice and mercy. And we begin to understand that there is a transformation that happens with us. Imagine as you enter into a relationship with somebody, those that we know that love us, that really love us, doesn't it soften you towards them? Doesn't it make you want to enter deeper into relationship with them? How many of y'all are married? Okay, there's like five of you. Okay, yeah, no. All right. You know, one of the things as, as a, a pastoral counselor we talk about is, is how do we show love to others? And how do we receive love? And what we normally do is the way that we show love to others is the way that we receive love. Let me give you an example of that. You've all heard about the five love languages. It's been around since like when I was in high school. That's yeah, not that old. Um, but what we normally do in, in showing love, my, my love language are small gifts. And my wife, every once in a while, just give me a, a little trinket, you know, uh, for our 25th wedding anniversary, she got me a watch. I love watches. I love watches. Oh, if I, oh, I love watches. But anyways, I'm not, but if you want to give me a watch, I'm, no, I'm not, no, okay. <clears throat> joking, joking. Every time I put that watch on, it was for our 25th anniversary, every time I put it on, it's a reminder that she loves me. And so what I try to do is I then, I, I thought, well, I'll get my wife little gifts telling her how much I love her. Well, that's not her love language. And so I would buy her these things, and she's like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> I'm like, daggone, honey. Our first wedding anniversary. You want to know about an epic fail? Our first wedding anniversary, I went out and bought a stereo. Did I tell you guys this story? This is great. I went out and bought a stereo for us. I mean, it... it First CD player we ever had. I mean, it's got the nice turntable. It's got the big receiver. It's got the massive Kenwood speakers. Again, I realize I'm showing my age here, okay? I'm telling you, at one point, the bigger the speaker, the cooler you were, okay? All right? I was cool, all right? Wife's coming in. I got Michael Bolton playing on the CD player. <laughs> oh, I was rocking it. I was so excited about this. And she walks in and she does one of these. She's like, where's this music coming from? And then she's like, what is that? I said, happy anniversary. And she's like, take it back. <laughs> I'm like, what? She goes, one, we can't afford it. And second, and I'm like, no, 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 this is our anniversary present. She goes, I don't want this. And I'm like, baby, I got Michael Bolton playing for you. I know when a man. Yeah, I got all of that stuff going, okay? It gets in this huge argument and then finally comes out, she goes out, she opens up the CD player, she breaks the CD and she goes, and I don't like Michael Bolton. <laughs> My wife's love language was quality time and acts of service. I, I got great enjoyment out of the stereo. <laughs> but to pour into my wife, and when I do that, that res it's reciprocal. Does that make sense? And God does all the work. He does all the work in that he pours into us trying to demonstrate his great love for us. And in doing so, it is a natural attraction to be with him. It's a natural attraction as I learn more and more of who he is 
for me to move closer and closer and closer to him. And so that is the first part of the book of Ephesians and what Paul is trying to tell us here. And then as he makes this shift into chapter four, because of God's great love for us, that he over time repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly shows us his great love for us. Paul then says, this is how we ought to live. If you've got your Bibles, hopefully you're in chapter four of Ephesians. I'm gonna start off. Now, depending on what translation you have, a number of you are gonna have the very first word in verse one of chapter four is therefore. Therefore means that everything that went before, now listen to this. Now, I'm preaching from, or using the NIV. Paul doesn't use that word, or the NIV doesn't translate it, but that's the idea. Because of this, now this. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul says in verse one, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. You see how much God loves us. We see the depths of wanting to enter relationship. Oh, it's relationship, 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 not religion. It's relationship with a living God. He wants to enter into relationship with you. Therefore, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And trust me, all of us have received that calling. God is knocking and has knocked and continues to knock on every single one of our hearts. If you're listening to me online, if you're watching this online, God is knocking on your heart. Folks in Fredericksburg, God continues to knock on your heart. He wants to enter into relationship with you. And with that, what we want to do, you have been called. We all have been called. The question is, will we answer? Will we answer? Now, Paul is gonna talk about answering this call and what it looks like, and I think it's in the middle section of chapter four, starting in verse 17, that we're gonna really start looking at this of how, what's the practical application of this calling and living up, and how do I live up to this calling? Paul writes, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. So these are not Paul's instructions as much as they are Jesus's instructions to us, okay? I insist upon this in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Now think about this. A couple weeks ago, I preached in chapter two about how God was unifying two people groups. You have the Jewish the people of God, and you have the people outside of of God, the Gentiles. And that is primarily each one of us, if we're not born into a Jewish family, we are considered Gentiles. But I will tell you, I want to go even beyond that. Because the Gentile really is anyone who does not have, who is not walking with Jesus Christ. And so the first thing that, G, that, that Paul talks about here in how we ought to live up to the calling we have, stop being a Gentile. Stop being a Gentile. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you have lived your lives as Gentiles? I have. I've been separated from God. I spent the first 30 years of my life separated from God. And I did what I thought was best. And Paul is telling us, stop being a Gentile. That's what you once were. Chapter two, that's what you once were. But now, but now we are something new. Through grace, God's grace, through faith, we are saved and we are moved from being outside to being insiders. From being a, you know, the, the, the filthy Gentiles to being members of his household. From being outside of God to being sealed with the Holy Spirit. From people lost and doomed to eternity apart from God, we are brought near. We are children. We are adopted into the family where we have a really, really, really good father. 
But so many times we choose to remain being a Gentile. We say, I know Jesus, but what we're really saying is, I know about Jesus, but I'm afraid to enter into relationship with him because if I enter into relationship with him, then something may have to change in me and I don't know what to do about change. And so what we do, we stay with that that idea with one foot in the world and one foot, foot in church and we struggle. And Paul goes on to say, and he says, listen, this is, this is the Gentile thinking. This is what separates those outside of Christ and those inside Christ. They are darkened in their understanding. And they're separated from the life of God. We've spent so much of our time separate, separated from the life of God. The life that God wants for us. And the reason why we're separated from this is because of our ignorance that is in due to the hardening of our hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. Let me ask you this, does that resonate with any one of you? It resonates completely with me because I didn't know better. And so I was making it up as I went along. And I will do, we will do what we think is right. And Paul calls calls it ignorance. I just didn't know any better. But I would tell you that even in that, that's not exactly true because there's a number of things that I've done that I I would hear in myself. You probably shouldn't do that, John. But I did it anyways. I persevered. Anybody done that? I eh, probably shouldn't do that. That Jiminy Cricket is sitting on your shoulder. Don't do it! Ah, and I go running into it. Eventually, there does become a hardening of the heart. Eventually, it becomes easier and easier and easier to do those things. And what that conscious was telling you, and I will tell you that that is the law that is written on our heart. The Old Testament tells us that. I believe it's the Holy Spirit. Even though you may not believe, there is still the common grace, what is known in theological terms as common grace. God does not want us to go down certain roads, but he will allow us out of his great love for us. I will allow you to make your own choice because I need for you, I need for us to come to him of our full volition, of our desire to come to him and say, okay, Lord, I surrender. Eventually, if I keep going away and in the opposite direction of Jesus, that small, still, quiet voice, that conscious, that Jiminy Cricket, that Holy Spirit, the law written on my heart becomes farther and farther and farther away from my thinking. And I can justify anything. But that is not who we are to be. Again, if I go back and see the depths of God's mercy and his grace and his love for me and wanting relationship with me and to transform me. This is how I ought to live. Paul's gonna go on and say, in verse 20, that, in other words, living like a Gentile, That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. So why do we hold why do we hold on to old behaviors? Why do we hold on to old thinking processes when God is renewing us and making us new and wanting to bring us into the fold? And we know this, you were taught, we were taught, I was taught. 
with regard to the former way of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Anybody got any deceitful desires? I have plenty of them. To be made new in the attitude of your minds. Verse 24, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. What Paul is talking to us about here, is you ready for this? This is the worst part of all of this. We got to change. We got to change. And we don't like change. I want to come to Jesus, but I still want to do the things I want to do. I want the benefits of Jesus. But am I willing to put the labor in? James remind us that faith without works is dead. It's nothing. But as Christians who have embraced and who've had the taste of the goodness of God, there is a desire. I want to do things differently. But in order to do things differently, I have to change. And the reality is, I love doing life in my lazy boy. In other words, I love, and maybe I'm the only one, I love comfort. I want the benefits of Jesus, but I'm not sure if I want to put the legwork in. And I will tell you that a lot of that is because it's driven right out of fear. Because right now, whatever I do, I may not like it, but I know the outcome. And if I know the outcome, I can control the outcome. And if I can control the outcome, I'm good. But the reality is, we are trying to hold on to the illusion of control. We really don't have control. And that's okay. Because in our former way of living, we showed what we can do when we thought we were in control. When Paul said with our our ignorance and our darkened understanding, my ideas don't work. As a, um, <clears throat> as a pastoral counselor, I have a, a model of counseling, these three kind of major concepts that overarch my counseling. And it is in the form of a hamburger. I will show people a picture of this hamburger. I realize it's pathetic. All right? But I want you to think about this. A hamburger consists of a top bun, a bottom bun, and the meat, Right? Well, the top bun of this, with counseling, if things aren't broken, guess what? We ain't going to fix it, all right? The bottom bun is once we find something that does work, we do more of it. But the meat of it, the USDA grade 100% beef with all the fixings, is figuring out what doesn't work and stop doing it. And we are people that love to keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. And what do we call that? And we're expecting different results each time. We call that insanity. You guys have heard that, yeah. We do that all the time. And what Paul is saying, listen, it's time to bring change. Allow Jesus to bring the change that he wants in you to give you the life that he wants you to have. And it's actually the life that each one of us have always wanted. A life of peace. But we get stuck in this, the meat, and we're chewing on the gristle And we keep doing the same things over and over again. And so what Paul is saying, listen, all you got to do is change. And so I want to give you three points about change. All right? Change is hard. Duh. But change is hard. Because the reality is we have years and years of thinking processes and behaviors. And what When we enter into relationship with Jesus, much of what is being asked of us is I need for you to cast that away and I need for you to do new things. And if you will do these new things, I will give you life. I will give you the very thing that feels like it's just outside of your grasp. 
when I walked into AA some almost 30 years ago, a guy by the name of Larry Warnalis, God love him, he has long since passed away, uh, just gave me tons of nuggets of information. First one was, shut up, John, and don't drink, all right? And then the next one was, uh, shut up, don't drink, keep coming back. I'm like, all right, all right. Uh, but Larry just poured into me time and time again. And he said, listen, John, the beautiful thing about this, if you really want to grasp a new life, you have to change one thing. And I'm like, all right, okay, what is it, sensei? And he goes, everything. That's a little overwhelming, but it's true. But this is the beautiful thing, is that the labor in this is mine and Jesus's. And what I need to do is I need to follow the lead of Jesus and he's the one that brings the change. I need to be willing to partner with the creator of the universe and allow him to do what he does best and that's bring change. Second thing, change is absolutely necessary. If we want different, we gotta do different. If we want different, we gotta do different. Paul calls this a change in the attitude of our thinking. He calls it a change in our attitude in all that we do. And that attitude is that I am not sufficient. See, my attitude is that I am sufficient. I'm good. What? I don't need you. But it is necessary because if anything that I have proven to myself and anything that you have proven to yourself when left to your own desires, left to your own wants, we can really, and this is one of my favorite words ever, we can really goon it up. And I'm tired of doing that. I want Jesus. I want to follow him. I want to be like him. I want to, as Paul says, put off the old self. And that's hard. The uh, home improvement industry, Troy, you'll appreciate this, because <clears throat> apparently you're seeing all of it, is a multi-billion dollar industry, right? Yeah, okay. Change is necessary sometimes. It's time, probably, if you've got the rust-colored shag carpeting, you may want to, just saying, okay? Anybody still have the avocado appliances? Yeah, okay, yeah. No, change is necessary. But change is necessary for us. If we want to be something, if we want to be different, we got to do different. And so you guys understand that. People are okay with change in some cases. It's okay to change the appearance of my kitchen and my appliances and my cabinets and my, my floors and my carpet. But please don't ask me to change me. No, no, no. It's necessary. Jesus came to bring change out of great love. Last part, you ready? And this is one that many of us may struggle with. Change is possible. Somebody here today needs to hear that. Change is possible. I don't care how far you have been living or how long you have been living apart from Jesus. I don't think Jesus necessarily is that concerned about how far, how long you have because the reality is he is always there telling you, I love you. I've always loved you. I know what you've done. 
I know what you're capable of doing. Because I was there. Jesus hung on a cross almost 2,000 years ago. And the last words he said is, it is finished. And with that, he gave up his spirit. And his body went limp on the cross. That word, it is finished, those words, it is finished, means just that, it's finished. The work that he has done for every one of us is finished. And so change very much is possible in that what he wants is relationship with you and he is the one extending the hand of relationship. And we're the ones that are like, but you don't understand. Change is possible. Paul says, put off the old. Put on the new. But I like the old. My kids, a number of years, I am the walking progressive commercial, by the way. I I really am. You know the guy that's got the shirt on and he's got one on a hanger and he goes, boy, I really like that shirt. Yeah. He buys the exact same shirt. My kids, my daughter did this one time. She pulled out like five pairs of shoes and she goes, dad, these are exactly, you've got the same shoes. And I'm like, no, I don't. No, I don't. No, I don't. She laid them all up and she goes, dad, these are the exact same shoes just in different colors. Maybe I do need to put on the new. But I like what I do. I like what I like. But Jesus is saying, put on the new. Try something new. I will tell you, if you look at that model, the hamburger model, maybe what you've been doing for so long really doesn't work. I know you know what the outcome is. And so you're willing to stay in that. I will tell you this. You know what the formula for change really is? Is when our emotional pain finally exceeds our fear of change. Think about that. When our emotional pain, our physical pain, finally exceeds our fear of change, we will actually begin to start doing things differently. Now, this is the kick. A lot of times, once that emotional pain starts declining because we're doing something different, we're like, okay, good. I'm good. And we get it back to status quo because we do like status quo. And so we stop doing the very things that lowered the emotional and the physical pain. And guess what? We do this back and forth for years, for years. Just maybe when we begin to really turn our lives over to the care of Jesus and he begins to make the transformation in us and things, yeah, it's hard, but things all of a sudden begin to start dropping down here and we keep on, we realize, wow, things are better because I've been doing things differently. Then all of a sudden what happens is this all starts going down and we, the life that Jesus has always wanted for us, goes up. I'm going to ask the worship team if they would come on out. We're going to land this plane real quick, and this is going to be really easy. As we continue in this series of Blueprint, my question for you is is this. Are you fighting change? What are the things that God is asking you to do? What are the changes that God wants for you? What is the old that you keep on putting on, the filth that you keep on putting on? And God is saying, no, 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 no. I want new. I've got all of this. I've laid out this beautiful brand new wardrobe for you. Why do you, why do you want to go back to the filthy rags? Because the reality is God doesn't want us to live in our filth. He doesn't. We're the ones that choose to stay in our filth. Jesus wants life and for us to have life. And so my question for you is, Are you ready? I know that there are people here that change has scares you to death. But you're miserable. And you're dabbling with your faith. You know about Jesus. 
but you're afraid to enter into relationship with Jesus. If you want things to be different, do different. Why do we want to stay in darkness when there's light? Why do we want to live a half-life when there is fullness of life? Would you be willing to allow Jesus to bring the change for you? And understand this as a really, really, really good father. He's going to do it out of great love for you. And as a really, 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 really good father, He's going to walk with you. So don't think for a second that you're doing this alone. But I am asking you this. And I would say that Jesus is even asking you this. And these are the instructions that Paul has given us. Embrace the change. And allow Jesus to transform every part of your life. Some of us have known about Jesus. Some of us have even professed Jesus, but we are still that one foot in, one foot out type thing. Stop. Stop. It is time for you to repent. It's time for you to turn and to go all in. It really is. And I understand it's gonna be fearful because we don't know the outcome. We can't control the outcome. But if he's a really, 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 really good father that loves us, don't you think the outcome would be really good? Some of you didn't think change is possible. I need to inform you this. Jesus came to bring change. From death to life. From darkness to light. Jesus came to bring change for you. Father God, I come to you and I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for your great word. I thank you that you are the agent of change. Not me, not us, not as an individual, but it is you. And you just simply ask for us to embrace you. And God, it is fearful to fall into the hands of a living God. But when I understand that you are a really, 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 really good father who loves us, who loves me. Oh God, give me courage. Give us courage to embrace change and allow you to do the transformation. Allow you to do what you do best. Take dead things and make them alive. Take things that were nothing and make them something gorgeous and brilliant. Oh God, take me, take us. Mold us and shape us and change us how you want us to be because we want to be people who are alive for you. No longer do I want to hide in the shadows. No longer do we want to live in the shadows, but we want to run in the light with you. And so God, I am asking that you would fill us. And God, if there is anyone here today who thinks for a moment that change isn't possible, I'm asking that you would speak directly to their heart. You are all about change and it's all for good. God, give them the courage for whatever their next step is to embrace your change. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey church, I'm gonna ask the prayer team, they're gonna be up here in just a moment. If you've never thought that change was possible or you've been so afraid of change and it's time, I'm gonna ask you to do something really, really brave. I'm gonna ask you to come up and speak with one of the prayer team. I'm gonna ask that you not only say, listen, that's me. I need to change. 
and allow them to pray with you and over you. And there may be somebody here, there may be somebody online or at the Fredericksburg campus who didn't ever think that change was possible. This is just who I am. I want you to know that what Jesus said is change is possible. And so if you've never accepted Jesus and accepted him to be the agent of change for you, I'm asking that today you would try something new and that you would accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and begin that walk with him. If you're online, there's gonna be an icon that comes up. Just punch on that and say, listen, I am, I'm raising my hand. I wanna go all in. If you're at the Stafford campus or the Fredericksburg campus, I'm gonna ask you to do something really bold. I'm gonna ask that you would come and that you would speak to, if you're here on the Stafford campus, come and speak to me, I'm gonna be right here. I'll walk you through this. If you're on the Fredericksburg campus, go and see Susan or go and see one of the prayer teams, one of the elders. Pastor Brian may be there. Let somebody know that it's time. I want to follow Jesus and I want change. Church, thank you for being here today. Let's stand and worship.